Pump is known for its grunge music. Hello and welcome to the very first Average Joe Conspiracy Show chat. My name is Adam Felton and during every episode I'll be inviting two guests onto the show where one will detail a conspiracy theory and it'll be their job to convince myself and the other guest that it's not complete poppycock. Joining me today I have Tom and Dave. They're both legends and also we used to play rugby with each other so just a disclaimer, we do know each other. So how are we doing guys? Hello. Hello. So starting off with Dave, so how are you keeping? You're right? Yeah, not bad. In the world of conspiracies, where would you put yourself as a believer in general? I am, for the most part, a massive sceptic. I really don't believe in the vast majority of conspiracy theories I read about. So when you're judging our theorists today, do you think you're going to be brutal or do you think that you could be easily swayed? Well, it depends, doesn't it, really, yeah, what sort of uh, route he goes down. I've, I mean, I'm familiar with the story, obviously, but, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting. Ah, oh, fantastic. Okay, so over to you, Tom. How are you keeping? Not bad, yourself? Yeah, very good. So, sort of same question to you. How do you see yourself in the grand scheme of conspiracy theories? No, I, I love a conspiracy theory. I just don't know a bit why I have to decide whether it's true or not. I, I like <laughs> looking at the theories and, and, you know, looking into it. And then just going out. Man. <laughs> no, fantastic. So um, how are you feeling today with your chosen conspiracy? Do you believe that you're going to, you know, win us over? Or do you think it's going to be a bit of a challenge? No, I think it's, it's going to be an easy one because, well, the ma- I thought the majority of people already knew about it. But um, I was proved wrong when I, I, I started discussing it with people. And the younger generation were just like, I don't know what you're going on about. Let's just hand over to you. And if you want to explain... Uh, the theory, what you believe, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so we're going to talk about Richard John Bingham today. Born 18th of the 12th, 1934, disappeared on the 18th of 1974, declared dead in 1999, but didn't get a death certificate until 2016. And more commonly known to everyone as Lord Lucan. Uh, he attended Eton College, and served at the Cold Spring Guard in West Germany between 53 and 55. He left the army and went to work at a merchant bank in the city of London. In 1960, he met Stephen Raphael, a wealthy stockbroker. They holidayed in the Bahamas, and he was taught to play backgammon. The same year, he won £26,000 in one game and left his job in the city to become a professional gambler. He also won the, uh, what is it, the West Coast of America. He, he was the champion of the whole of the West Coast of America. Uh, of doing what? Sorry, backgammon? Playing backgammon. He was ranked wow. in the top 10 in the world at playing backgammon. Um, but just a, a little bit of background, um, he, he was offered the uh, role of the first James Bond. Right. Um, he, was, he was big, you know, he was very famous. They were in the papers all the time. He, he raced power boats, drove a drophead Aston Martin coupe, rented private planes and yachts. And, so uh, basically he was James Bond. He, he was, yeah, he was James Bond. They, you know, they honeymooned on the Orient Express, first class, him and his wife and uh they were in the newspapers regularly and um it, it seemed like he was you know he was lucky lucan that was his nickname he was this this big playboy um it turns out he was actually um losing more than he was winning by a lot a considerable amount in 1968 he uh, he paid more in race entries for his horses than he won it wasn't going very well for him by 72 the gambling addiction and his wife's mental health had taken a toll on the marriage and they separated. He started a bitter dispute for custody of the children. Um, by 1974, it was estimated he spent £20,000 on private investigators to try and prove that his wife was unfit to look after their children. Um, that's roughly equivalent to £270,000 in today's money. Bloody hell. Um, so it wasn't, going, it wasn't going well for him. He lost the custody battle. A couple of days before he disappeared, he was out having lunch with a uh, racing driver, Graham Hill. Right. At the uh, the Claremont Club, owned by John Aspel, one of his close friends. So just to confirm, John Aspel is the, the famous Aspel, zoo owner. Yeah. 
he he owns port he owns sorry portland and um how yeah right yeah yeah they're all all part of the same club all part of the same set they're all ex eaton and uh Are your notes down a well? <laughs> <laughs> I need I need to construct. If I if only on your carpenter could stuck something that would hold things up in the air, so I could read. <laughs> so yeah, seventh of November, nineteen seventy four. There was a break in his house. He's uh, he's the nanny of the children was uh, was murdered. Susan Eleanor Rivet uh, was the name of the nanny. She usually had a Thursday night off to visit her boyfriend. Um, she changed that week and had the Wednesday off. She'd gone downstairs to make a cup of tea for for Lady Lucan, and uh, was attacked with a lead pipe that was covered in tape, um, beaten to death. Her you know, body had then been stuffed into a mail sack, left under the stairs. Uh, around about this time, Lady Lucan had gone to the head of the stairs and said, uh, you know, "What's going on?" She noticed it'd been a long time, and then she was attacked. She says that the, the attacker told her to shut up, and that's when she realised that it was her, it was her husband or ex-husband, Lord Lucan. She actually said that she'd had a conversation with him after it, it, she'd managed to stop him from attacking her. Like he'd taken her to a room upstairs, cleaned her up, put the uh, the eldest of the children back to bed, and uh, and said to her, oh, 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 I don't really know what happened there. According to her, she'd said, well, I'll tell you what, we, we can get over this. It'll all be okay. He went to the bathroom to uh, to get some towel to help her clean herself up. And she realised that he wouldn't be able to hear her from there. So he'd, uh, he legged it. She legged it out of the uh, house into a, a pub across the road, the plumber's arms. The police turned up, kicked the door in. They uh, found the uh, the body of Nanny in the basement. We found the children asleep upstairs. That's when the investigation started. No sign of Lord Lucan. They went to his his uh, apartment he'd been staying in. Uh, they found the keys to his car, his passport, his watch, his wallet, uh, a book on Greek shipping type millionaire tycoons that he'd been reading through, uh, a suit and a shirt that pressed for dinner that night, but nothing else. His, uh, his blue Mercedes was uh, still parked outside, uh, cold engine, flat battery, couldn't start it. Um, what do you, What's the conspiracy then? Well, the conspiracy is around what actually happened to him after that. His, his wife um, only recently committed suicide, his ex-wife. Oh, I, I, I knew that she had passed in 2017, but I didn't realise it was suicide. Yeah, she uh, she became estranged from the rest of the family. The worst thing for her was being alone. She didn't want to slip into old age and have to depend on someone. Um, just as a final kick in the teeth, her entire estate was left to the homeless uh, charity shelter. So I've got a few questions. <coughs> um, okay. First of all, do you think he did it? Yes, without a doubt. And second of all, do you think he's alive? If so, where is he? I don't. I don't believe he's still alive. Um, there is a lot of, of theories to say he's still alive. Um, in fact, uh, twenty twenty this this well, last year, January twenty twenty, the nanny's uh, illegitimate adopted son, his, his uh, adoptive mother died thirteen years before, and left him an envelope saying that he was a uh, adopted and who his real mum was. Oh wow! Since then, he spent thirty thousand of his own pounds. Uh, investigating, trying to find Lord Luke. He thinks he has found him in Australia. Um, yeah. Living with a, another pair of, of English people and a, an Australian carer. Um, but no, I don't. I, I think he, he did it. He got to the point where he realised he could no longer um, go for custody of the children, I think. This is, what I, this is my theory. He, um, he realised that with the, the long history of, of mental health, which he'd actually kind of pushed for you know he's taking her to the hospital trying to get her uh, committed yeah. um, but if he just disappeared her, there's no body found they would just say well she was mad and she's obviously walked off and and you know yeah. it would be her the, 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 the whole conspiracy would be her I, I just believe that it would just be brushed under the carpet um, when he realised he'd made the mistake he uh, he did it but I think he did it in 
away that the body would never be found. Um, there's, there's a couple of theories to that. I mean, one of his speedboats was missing from uh, from New Haven, and uh, they believe he took it out, scuffed it, filled his pockets with stones, and right. ran with it. The other one that that Lady Luke and believed right up into her death was that he got onto the New Haven ferry and jumped into the propellers from the back of the ship. Yeah, having a a working knowledge of, of boats, he you know it wouldn't have been too hard for him to do. Yeah. But that would mean that his estate wouldn't have been able to be touched until it's usually seven years or seven years or more, by which time his children would be old enough to inherit it. None of it would have gone to his, his ex-wife. She wouldn't be able to touch it. I think it, he did it in a way that she still couldn't win, couldn't get her hands on, on the, the title or any of the money, or not that there was any money. So, first of all, Dave, what, what, what's, what's your initial thoughts on this? Oh, I think he did it as well. Um, I don't think there's too much about it. I think it was because he was going in there much the same as um, Tom had said, and he surprised the wrong person. So um, I don't believe he topped himself, though. What, what do you reckon? Uh, well, I think one of the popular theories, which I I think is plausible, is that um, Aspinall um, got him out of the country. Uh, I think it was a mid-90s documentary done by the BBC. And Aspel basically said that he hadn't heard from him, but if he had heard from him, he would have done everything he could to get him out of the country and do whatever he wanted. And he, they said, well, even if he, you knew that he had killed his wife, he said, under any circumstance, I would have helped him. But I didn't, so that's that. So you kind of think, well, is that a confession or is he just... <laughs> <having blood?" laughs> so it, it's interesting. There are a few details to the story which... I think are interesting and I think you could easily play devil's advocate with this. So it said that when Lord Lucan first went to the, the Claremont club, they shouted down a bellboy or, or the, uh, the doorman and asked if his friends were in there. And he said, no friends aren't in there. He said, fine. And drove off. This was apparently unusual behavior for Lord Lucan. However, this happened at approximately quarter to nine. So apparently Veronica states that the nanny <coughs> went down to make the tea at five to nine and the daughter, the eldest daughter, who was working out the times based on when she finished watching Top of the Pops and then when she started watching, um, I think it was Mastermind, worked out that it was got to be, it had to be more quarter two. So it works out that the police drove backwards and forwards from the club to the house. And they worked out an average time of between seven and 12 minutes. And the times for him to then get back, to go in, to go downstairs, to take the light bulb out and to hide just in time. It, it just seems if he was going to plan this out, it just seems very rough. Some people would say it's, it would be almost impossible to get back, but that's assuming that all the times are absolutely accurate. Well, I just think that the, the story that he told his mother on the phone and the story that his brother always sticks to is that he was just driving past, he looked into the basement and he saw they were shot. You, know, you don't just drive past anywhere looking and be able to see anything in that detail. No. You drive in slowly. Like you said, there was no light in the basement. The bulb had been taken out. I mean, there is that, but I mean, I mean, it's plausible that he could be going there because, I mean, he'd spent an awful lot of money on surveillance. So, I mean, he was definitely version on stalking i'd have thought so i mean that bit mm, yeah also just watch um veronica's interviews have been very have been inconsistent in a few cases first of all she says that um she heard her husband say um shut up and then with an interview, I believe it was the News of the World in the early 80s, stated that she wasn't 100% sure it was her husband. And then in another interview in uh, the, I think it was about five years ago, it must have been just before um, she took her own life. She comes up with this story that she had this full blown conversation and she never lost any real consciousness. She fell down in between his legs halfway down the stairs and then she went and inspected the body and they had this whole conversation and then went upstairs and she blames the original interviews on the fact that she was drugged all the time. So she didn't know what she was saying. So she was clearly suffering from mental health issues, but you sort of see her in the interviews and she, 
she comes across as very cold and almost narcissistic the way that she talks about her children and almost saying well i don't speak to them anymore um she she didn't really care for them she she you know you know i i, I don't know about your experience but I've, I've got family who are in that kind of not that that high up but you know in that kind of eaten mafia type you know high society london and it just seems yeah it seems like normal you know i mean you look at the people who are from the eaten mafia sect and you think yeah i can, I can just imagine them doing it mm. no that's it you you wronged me that's it i'm cutting you off sounds like maybe, a yeah. mess <laughs> how, long, how long have you been lining that one up <laughs> <laughs> I can take that off my notes now <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there's a story that I mean Lady Osborne told the, the police and the newspapers that the last she heard of him he was being fed to the tigers at my son's zoo <laughs> yeah but, I mean that's another one of those things it could have been a double bluff because she, she, I mean if, if my thoughts on it are that he did go down there was sheltered there and then was flown out the country by Aspinall um, she would definitely have known about it because, I mean, because of who she was. So, yeah. so she might be trying to throw them off by saying, oh, that's where he is. She's lying. Yeah. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. So with the coroner's jury, that it, there wasn't allowed, uh, the, uh, the um, there wasn't a defence um, for Lord Luke and allowed. It was all pretty much based on a one-sided story. And he um, also, the they've kind of... Oh, sorry. The last murder that was tried that way. Oh, really? That it was stopped. Yeah. The judge was reportedly really put, you know, influencing his personal view to the the jury, um, and there wasn't allowed a, a defence. And it was pretty. Also, it was like based on the fact that he's absent, so he must be guilty. Where now there there've been a fair few cases where people have disappeared not you know not because they're guilty but because they're scared they will be or there's other factors to it um, I, I think the thing when i talked to to some of the lads at work when i spoke to about it obviously a bit younger than me and uh it, people just find it crazy that somebody was that big that much of a celebrity could just disappear mm. i mean yeah. this, you couldn't do that now in this day and age you couldn't you know but no, yeah. since everything's instantly trackable, isn't it? So all, all the phone calls he made would have been easily trackable, and everything's like that. So, but not just—I mean, the yeah. cameras everywhere, facial recognition now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, stranger than that was that uh, in 1974, Australian police actually did believe they'd caught Lord Lucan. It turned out he was a Labour MP called John Stonehouse who had faked his death a month before. <laughs> he, he wasn't the only bloke. There's a few others on that as well, yeah. There's, there's a chap they found apparently in New Zealand who turned out to be a, a folk singer that had disappeared. And, uh, they they um, searched somewhere, I don't know where the actual park or whatever it was that they searched, but they, they dug up some bones, but they were from a judge that had disappeared a little while ago. <laughs> He left the murder weapon on the steps. He left the lead pipe, which had come from the same cut that had been wrapped in tape in the back of his car that was found in New Haven. Sorry? It wasn't confirmed. They weren't able to to tell that it was the same uh, pipe. True, but at the same time, if I had killed my wife with a lead pipe that had been wrapped in, uh, in bandage tape, yeah. And then there was a lead pipe wrapped in bandage tape in the back of my car. You'd be able to go, this is connected because it's such an unusual item to have. Yeah, You say that, but then, the, you know, the letters he wrote all turned up bloodstains. If you were definitely, you weren't guilty, you wanted to prove it, you, you know, you get rid of the pipe. If it was me, I'd get rid of the pipe. I'd you'd clean your hands, wouldn't you? We you wrote the letters. Well, the other thing is that he was surprised, wasn't he? Because he, he'd gone there and, and supposedly intended to kill his wife, found someone else accidentally murdered someone else and then had to do one didn't he so it's kind of he may have planned it out but obviously it all went tits up he would have had a bit of blood on him because he then helped his wife up the stairs who had blood on her um i think they found they found some of um lady lucan's blood in the car but none of the nannies right so and and again the daughter who was upstairs watching mastermind when they burst through the door um said that lord lucan wasn't covered in hardly any blood and they reckoned that it was so gruesome the way that the nanny had been killed with just you know it was one blow but there was a hell of a lot of blood from it surely he would have been caked in the stuff apparently uh, one of the friends who he went to straight away afterwards there was some blood in his pocket but he said he'd slipped over in a pool of blood 
so yeah, the, the, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff where I think it's it's not necessarily a uh, an open and closed yeah. case. I think um, I watched a brilliant. I'll I'll link it in the in the um, comments below in the details below. But I watched two documentaries. Um, I watched the BBC one that was filmed and broadcast in the mid '90s, and another ITV one, uh, which was which came out about five years ago. And the first documentary details it in such a way where it's kind of uh, building it up as if he committed the crime and then pretty much halfway through they turn it on its head and then they detail it as if it wasn't him and i think it was done in, yeah. in, a, in a really good way that actually raises um a, a fair few questions um well, it's one of those i think to a certain extent um i mean one of the plausible things is, is that he could have run because he was pretty damn sure he was going to get convicted which is what he said in the letters yeah and i mean to a certain extent it was trial by media in the, in the following days and weeks where they pretty much um, pronounced him guilty from the start. So, mm. no, I, it's... I just think that he, he just set it up. You know what I mean? He just set it up. But even to the point where the, the um, brother-in-law that the children then went to live with, with uh, Veronica's youngest sister, actually said, told her face to face, you are a bit peculiar and I'd have beaten you if you were my wife as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, I think he just he kept pushing that oh, you're you're mentally ill, you're mentally ill. You should, yeah, you know, yeah. He and then me taking off my devil horns. Um, there were there were little things again. Watching the ITV interview where Lady Luke and just details this. Um, I kind of think, well, why didn't you mention this before? But she does mention it. When she fell into this depression, um, Lord Lucan um, tried spanking her into um, into happiness, I guess, which is... It's what yeah. you do, surely. You've got to that. It, <laughs> but he clearly got sexual gratification out of it, but he used to hang the, the, the switch or the cane or whatever it was in the um in the cupboard and what he did was wrap a plaster tape around the edges of it to stop it from cutting her and hurting her and it's it's little details like that you kind of think mm. <laughs> see this is the point i get to and i think well, I, with all conspiracies i think you know it's nice it's good i've looked into it and that's let's put this one to bed then um so do you want to give like a, a final case, a final statement, Tom, and then uh, we'll go from there? He, or he, didn't, he tried to kill his wife. He killed the nanny by accident. He thought he, if he'd killed his wife, that would have been the, the custody for the children would have gone to him. Uh, once he realised the mistake he'd made, there was only one course of action for him to do. He either had to leave or he had to, to kill himself. If he'd have left, he'd have been tracked down, as people are still trying to do now. And, you know, it's always been said he, he wouldn't have survived outside of England. He, you know, he's a, an English gentleman. He didn't like travelling. Um, he liked to go somewhere and come back. You know, his favourite bit was coming home. Um, I think he did it the way he did it so the body would not be found so that the um, the, the seven years would have meant that his children could then inherit his title, all his money, his, his estate. I mean, he was almost bankrupt. But he still had trust. They still had family trust. The family trust paid the last of his debt off in like three years. You know, um, I think he, he did it to try and protect his children in his mind. I'm not trying to say that there was anything wrong with the way they were being brought up. I don't know. But in his mind, he got to the point where that was the only option. Dave, I'm going to ask you to give a, what your thoughts and then I want you to score this between one and 5.5. 5. One oh. being, um, you don't believe it at all, 5.5 5 saying absolutely sold. That, that is a plausible one. And I, I think the um, the reasoning behind it is, is pretty sound. So essentially, um, if he's declared dead after seven years, um, they'd get his things. But I, I don't think he killed himself. I, I personally think that um, Aspinall got him out of the country and uh, sheltered him in, um, uh, in Kenya. Because he has been spotted, alleged, well, apparently unproven, um, in Kenya, India, well, yeah. in South Africa, I think. In the 1970s, it was 
are much easier to disappear someone like that than it, than it is. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so what are you scoring this then, Dave? I'm giving it a three. Okay. Or maybe a three and a half, actually. I'll give it a three and a half. The reasoning behind it is sound. I just, I just, I, I don't think he killed himself. I'm happy with that. Statistically, it is the husband that usually does commit the murder, and I think they ran with that. I do think it was a bit of a, um, a kangaroo court. Um, I think there are many things that sort of raise an eyebrow um, as to um, the, the way it all went about, the timings between going from the club to getting to the house. Um, obviously, he's not around to answer to these questions, so we, we, we won't likely ever know. However, I think it is... Um, I think if you were going to, if I was going to put a million pound on who done it, I would have to say the husband, but I don't think it is clear cut. Um, So I'm also going to reward it a 3.5. So our verdict is that we find that your conspiracy, that Lord Luke had killed the nanny in an error, then attacked his wife, then killed himself in such a way that the body couldn't be found to ensure his inheritance goes to his children, we find plausible. How do you feel on that, Tom? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, it is plausible. You know, the bloke had previous for knocking him about. Uh, who else are you going to blame for it? Um, whether he, whether he, uh, he, t- he, he did kill himself or he... You know, it's always going to be up for debate unless they either find him or they find remains, which I don't think they ever will. Excellent. All right. So that that, that brings us to a, a close then. So um, thank you very much, guys, for doing this first podcast and um, hope you've enjoyed it. And I, and I understand that you guys will be back for a another chat. Really enjoyed it. Can't wait yeah, to come back and listen to Dave's one. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you've liked what you've seen today, please like, share and subscribe and tune in next time. Thank you.